This is Sean T, and it's time to trust and believe. What's up, everybody? Today, we have an amazing guest, someone who I consider to be one of the most positive people on the internet with, uh, you know, just a little a little bit of sass on his other page. So yeah. I know him as Tank Sinatra from Tank's Good News Instagram page, which I think has been the driving force for people changing their mindset in terms of going to social media to actually search for something good rather than always focusing on the negative because we get negative everywhere. And I just believe that this Instagram page has blown up because people always need, not want, people need goodness in their life and good news. They need to hear something great every single day. And we all know with politics, with the pandemic, with just the world in general, we can always fall into negativity, even in our own minds. So today I welcome Tank Sinatra to Yeah. As what's up? I'm good, man. Very good. Thanks for that intro. That was uh that gave boost my self esteem a little bit. <laughs> well you maybe it was my ego. I don't know. Whichever one. <laughs> Ego or self-esteem, I'll take whatever one. <laughs> but I think, you know, for you are what we need right now. You know, I help people in fitness and, you know, obviously motivation here and there, but you really do a great job bringing the masses together, I think, from all walks of life to, to you know, see something positive every day. Why? Tell me, what was the driving force for you wanting to bring that goodness to people? Um, I... I I feel like it's my personal mission to try and not change people's mindsets, but just show them a different set of data that maybe they hadn't been exposed to before while they were conscious. So I saw a speech on YouTube many years ago from the Charlie Chaplin movie, uh, the dictator. Mm. Uh, It was called the greatest speech ever made. It was spliced together with modern images and video, but basically have you ever seen it before? No. Oh, Sean. I mean, I watched it. Once every six months, probably, I cry every time still. I've been watching it for like 15 years. It's a combination of what he's saying and the videos and the images that they chose. But basically, he says people are good intrinsically and they want to help and they want to be there for the people that they care about or strangers because people are only strangers until you get to know them. So if you can break down that barrier, then nobody's really a stranger. Everyone is you. You are everyone. And... I feel like people lose that along the way. They get broken either through, um, you know, parenting, which I I, I guess the the main thing is that I've never blamed anybody for my attitude, Um, but I've given credit where credit is due because I've had things happen in my life that should have had a much more negative effect on me and they wind up having a positive effect. And I've had things that were neutral have a negative effect and vice versa all across the gamut, positive, negative, negative, positive. Um, And it really would have, it came down to is how you look at whatever experience you're going through and what you can get out of it. And then once you get something out of it, what you can give to other people, if you looked at life through that lens, you just never, nothing ever happens. That's intrinsically bad. It's always neutral and it's what you make of it. That's what I believe. I mean, obviously there are situations like, you know, uh, kids being molested, people being murdered, loved ones being, uh, you know, tra- trafficked or whatever. That's, there's always, when I speak, I try and speak in generalities. There's always a bottom 3% of tragedy that people say, well, this happened to me. How could you say that when this happened to me? And, I'm, and my answer to that specific person is, you are not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the person that gets cut, cut off in traffic and lets it ruin two weeks of their life. That's who I'm talking to. Not the person who was beaten as a child and can't seem to shake it. I'm with you on that. That's something that I can't even imagine. So if... That's what you have to overcome, but just know that the greater the tragedy, usually the, the bigger the upside. So if you can overcome that and you can then turn that around and be of service to people who are going through the same thing, your life is going to take on new meaning. Um, but it's very, very hard to jump over that, that barrier and for people to say, all right, I was a victim. I was definitely a victim. This was not any choice I made. I did not deserve this but I'm not going to be a victim anymore. I'm going to be of service to people who are currently victims and try and show them that they don't have to be victims anymore. They don't have to carry this around forever. Yeah. I think 
one of the things, the blessings that came from my sexual abuse was that I don't know why at such a young age, I actually said, I'm not going to be a victim. I don't know where that came from. I think, yeah, I, who knows? I just automatically kind of put my, myself in a role of protecting other people from this person. And yeah. so, but I mean, at the end of the day, you still have residual effects of, you know, tragedy. So, but I, I totally get what you mean, how to bottom 3%. There are people who've been through something, but I've, I think the interesting thing is why, the why we let someone who cut off, cut us off in traffic or those things, you know, affect us in such a, a great way. And I, I personally think it comes from just the baggage that has been happening maybe in that particular day or over that past week. What have yeah. you seen or noticed from people and and I want to I want to talk about the goodness, but I think it's really important that we talk about people who sometimes focus on the negative. It's like sometimes you post amazing, you know, amazing things, but you still get people that say ridiculously negative. Yeah. Where, where do you think that comes from? So I be, I'm a big believer in the cumul, cumulative effects of anything, good or bad, over a period of time. And I think that when people get upset over minor infractions in society, it's 100% due to them not taking, them, taking care of themselves on some level, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. When you're taking care of yourself and you're, you know, self-love is one of those things that kind of got washed in with the, the new age hippie, you know, weirdo movement. But self-love is like, self-love is it, everything. If, I, if there was two words that I could, say for the rest of my life when people ask me how do I improve my life self love is it whatever that means to you you figure it out but if you're you know if you're if you slept poorly woke up late didn't eat breakfast now you're rushing to work you're in traffic and someone cuts you off of course that's going to piss you off way more than had you gone to sleep early woke up early exercise had a good breakfast drank some water drank a cup of coffee left with plenty of time to get there someone cuts you off it's really not that big of a deal. It's just part of what happens in traffic, maybe. And then if you're doing all that, you look at that person and you go, oh, that person must be having a bad day. They seem out of it. Instead of that person left their house planning on ruining my day today, which is never the case. No. But you feel like that. Yeah, I think that that's so true. You know, we, again, it's all the residual stuff that comes before, you know, the negative thing that, kind of I want to say is like the breaking point if you will um so I want to talk I really want to talk about good stuff though I mean I think it's really important that yeah. you brought up the cumulative effect I think that's something I mean I've never heard of it uh, explained like that before which is so dope um all right so I've always wanted to ask you this and you know we've only met in person once but I still consider you a friend yeah. <laughs> uh what has been your top two or three stories that you've ever posted about? Like something that you think about every day that just kind of gets to pulls your heartstrings in a really good way. I think about the, 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 the stories that I think of are usually from the earlier days because I was, you know, I was just, I was as, as much affected by the stories as everyone else is. Not that I'm not now, but I'm a little bit more, I hate to say it, but like used to it. So, which is good. I mean, I'm, there's getting used to bad treatment and toxicity. And then there's getting used to good stuff, which is, I think obviously way better. But there was one story that I posted. It was, it was within like the first month. There was a girl who was a victim of domestic abuse, right? Um, pretty like pretty brutal domestic abuse. Her, her boyfriend, her husband, I don't remember what it was, knocked all of her teeth out. And Sean, I mean, it's hard to picture what that must be like until you realize how big of a deal you or I make when we have a piece of spinach in our teeth and we don't want to smile at the dinner table. Cause someone goes, you got something in your teeth. All of a sudden, you, <laughs> oh, that's funny. You don't want to show your teeth. So this girl had all of her teeth knocked out, which is em embarrassing on the surface. But then the reason for it is probably even more embarrassing because she doesn't want to explain to people what happened to your teeth. And obviously you know, I don't know what the girl's situation was, but she didn't have 30000 to shell out for new teeth. So the dentist gave her a whole new set of teeth. And the smile in this girl's face in the after picture could light up, you know, a solar system. You know, I mean, just unbelievable. 
And then the other one is this guy who, there was, there was the California wildfires, not the last one, the one before that. So it was like two and a half years ago. You remember that one? It was really, really big. Oh, yes. I actually was talking about that yeah. one. You were just talking about it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the wildfires are, are crazy. I hope that this year is um, a little bit better. Yeah. But, or no, or no fires at all would be great. But there was a guy who was on the side of the road. He was probably like 17 or 18. And he was on the side of the road. And the, I mean, the backdrop is just ablaze completely. Like the whole thing is just fire. And he's like this, like he's standing on the side of the road like this. You can tell he's like trying to do something, but you can't figure it out, figure out what it is. All of a sudden you see him throw his hands down, run into the fire. Like you would think there was a, a like a person or something in there that he was going to rescue. So he, um, he overcomes his fear, and that's what I got from the video. It's like every time I think of the word bravery or courage, I think of this kid, and he comes running out of the forest fire, and he has a bunny in his hand. Uh-huh. So like something happened where this guy saw this wild animal, and he was like, he was weighing his risk versus reward. He's like, I don't even know if I can get in there and get out. Plus, I assume it was a wild rabbit, but the rabbit allowed him to grab it, which you, if you've ever tried to catch a rabbit, you know how, how hard it is. It's very tough. Our kids like to chase the rabbits. So they- yeah, mine too. <laughs> yeah. So for some reason, those stories uh, stick out the most. But then, not to go negative here, but there was one story that kind of showed me that this thing is not... I thought Tanks Good News was going to be untrollable when I first started it. Yeah. And when I was a senior in high school... When I was a, a junior in high school, I was getting to the point where I was like, my, my health was pretty bad. I was so, like severely overweight. Um, self-esteem was through the floor. And over the summer, the summer between junior and senior year, to deal with those feelings, I just ate. I mean, I ate, Sean, for two and a half months straight, just whatever was in front of me. When I came back to school senior year, this guy said to me, he goes, bro, he goes, you look, he's like, is everything all right? You look like, you know, you gained more weight from the last time I saw you. And at that, in my mind, I was already fat the last time he saw me. Now he's saying that I'm fatter. Long story short, I decided to completely change my diet, started drinking like a gallon of water a day. I started walking to work, which was, I couldn't walk to school. School was too far, but I would walk to work, which was like a mile and a half, walk home. And I lost like 60 pounds over the course of six or seven months. Wow. Totally, completely changed my life. So I saw a story of a kid who was being bullied and he decided to start walking to school. So it wasn't work, it was school. Changed his whole diet, started drinking a ton of water. He lost like 120 pounds, right? So that court, that story struck a chord with me. And what happened was it was all good for like 20 minutes. And then somebody, the problem with the internet is that certain people, depending on what kind of day they're having, look at something and interpret it the worst way possible. They take the worst possible viewpoint of it. And a comment said something like, this is pro-bullying. You're saying that bullying works. If you want to get people healthy, then you need to bully them. And I was like, man, this sucks. This really sucks. Not, my, not me, but the fact that you can't look at a story like this and feel happy for the kid, it just made me sad to know that no matter what I do, there's always going to be somebody that has a problem with it. But it also alleviated any pressure for me to try and please everybody because I figured out that no matter what I do, somebody's always going to have a problem with it. So it was like a, a double-edged sword. You know, I wasn't, I don't really necessarily want to get into politics, but I want to talk about something that's really important because you actually brought it up in that story. And this is a, it's kind of really tough to talk about. I know in politics, there's, you know, what people do for communities, whether it's, you know, the governors, the mayors, the senators, the the president or whatever. But for me, a lot of times it really comes down to being a good person and how good you want to treat people. And, you know, a lot of times when I vote, I have to say to myself, well, no one's perfect. So I'm not, I don't think that any particular, you know, plan, be it health insurance or financial plan is going to work for everyone. It's really impossible. Yeah. What I do believe could work for, I'm going to use 97% because you brought up 3%. Yeah. (laughs) I believe that for 97% of people, being nice 
can work. And so I vote for who I think is going to treat humans the best. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times, and I'm just going to say it, last night, Michelle Obama was, you know, she gave her speech at a Democratic National Convention. And I like to tell people, I'm going to watch the Republican National Convention, too, because I believe that you should look at both, you know, see what's in front of you. But the comments that they said about this woman, they weren't even about her viewpoints in terms of what she may have said about the president or, you know, what she says is like good for the country. They said some horrible, yeah. things, like shave your face or, you know, what is that thing you're sitting on between your legs? The hatred that comes from people when people are really just trying to be good. Yeah. You know, one of the things I said, the hatred, if, if you have to lead with hate towards other people, I strongly believe that you have hate inside of yourself and there's something that you don't like. Oh, of course. And so, and then I look at you and what you do every day and you bring these, I, I think you've built an amazing empire and I want, actually want to ask how, because I think it'll help a lot of people, you know, with your diligence and focus, but yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm just, it was something that affected me so horribly. And I remember you last night, I was like, Oh, I'm talking to tank tomorrow. I, I know. He's- <laughs> you know, how do people get around that? Like when you, when someone does post something that's really happy, like they lost weight or they're really excited. Or, and then someone just comes in and bashes their entire, you know, positive energy. How do you deal with that? How do you help people deal with that? Um, I can't help anybody deal with that. I can only, I mean, I, I can, I'm barely keeping my head above water on this myself, but I did have a pretty, what I consider major revelation. It was either yesterday or the day before. And I was, so you have like, um, you have people who are, have a, an inability to put themselves in someone else's shoes for whatever reason. I believe that there, I mean, I don't believe this. It's, it's been, I mean, I didn't come up with this concept. There's mechanical intelligence, there's spatial intelligence, there's artistic intelligence, emotional intelligence. I think that the reason a lot of creative people, celebrities, musicians, actors, um, dancers, whatever, lean left is because they have a high emotional intelligence. And for that reason, they're able to see what it might be like to be somebody else. So they don't want anybody to suffer. The people on the right who love Trump have good mechanical intelligence. A lot of these guys are construction workers or, um, you know, blue collar, just working men. And they're really good with their hands, but they can't imagine what it must be like to be black or a woman or gay or trans or anything like that. So I think that's where the disconnect comes from. But I saw, so this guy, I'm not going to say his name because he's, I believe he's a decent person, but he just plays to this character on the internet He posted a video of a black person saying all lives matter, right? Black person shouting, all lives matter, all lives matter. So it occurred to me, like when when black lives matter became what it is today, I mean, I'm not talking about what happened seven years ago or five or three. I'm talking about in its current state that it is where everyone's like, oh, we, we were missing a major piece here. Like these people are, they've been talking about this for decades. We should start listening. Everyone was like, oh, yeah, you think? Anyway, so the word ally was being thrown around a lot. And these people who were the All Lives Matter people were like, allies, you know, what's an ally, a blah, 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 that doesn't make any sense. I almost said to this guy, black people feel, so when white people speak up for black people, black people feel how you feel seeing that black guy yell, All Lives Matter. They feel like, oh, here's somebody who doesn't look like me talking the same language, pushing my values. That's all it is. So if you can make that connection, maybe you can go to the other side and say, you know what, I was missing a piece of the story. I'm going to listen a little closer to what you were saying and not judge it and not compare it to my life and not, you know, disregard. People have a big problem with the term white privilege, I think, because it means that they had a head start and they still couldn't make it work, which is very hard for some people to swallow. The fact that they were not dealing with this problem of race and they still are not able to make their, you know, live the life that they want to live. I would get really frustrated at people who would point the finger at other people rather than work on themselves. That was like a big pet peeve of mine. And I realized this is a psychological axiom. They're only able to recognize what they hate about somebody else because they have it in them. 
So when I'm looking at them and I'm saying, you're only, you're talking about what's wrong with someone else. So you don't have to work on yourself. I realize that that's something that's in me also. And I need to work on that. So that was like one of the final frontiers. Cause I always said, I never judged people. I only judged people who judge other people. That was like my little cute way of saying like, I don't like people who have no tolerance or I have no tolerance for people who are intolerant. But yeah, that was a pretty major, um, pretty major eye opening. Like the fact that I'm looking at these people who are looking at other people rather than work on themselves. Same thing. Yeah. I, I, I just was really tough. Cause I did not understand. I don't understand how, even if I would like say you and I were, you know, we were stuck in the elevator <laughs> for, you know, four days and we started to get frustrated and even though I might express express frustration to you or you know whatever I'm I, I don't have it in me to make you feel bad to bring you down I yeah so to me it's just really hard uh, to understand that which is so interesting I never heard you know what you talked about in terms of you know I'm an artist a singer a dancer you know, I think actors too, a lot of times, obviously not all, but they're able yeah. to know what it's like to put themselves in someone else's shoes. When That's I what they do for a living. All right. <laughs> As we were talking about before we started this podcast, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that was so hard. But when I'm actually shooting my workouts, I'm actually thinking about what it's like for the person on the other side of the screen. No, really? I'm not trying to make it easy for you. Yeah. I'm saying things to help you through it. And I'm putting myself in your shoes in terms of, okay, well, I know how I feel. They must feel worse because this is what I do as a profession. What do I need to say to make them feel great? You know, so it's those kind of things where, you know, you made a lot of sense for there are some people who don't, they're just unable to put themselves in someone else's shoes. And, you know, I mean, I don't know how to get it across it on the tribe, but I mean, even like if I post something like the other day, I just posted, make sure you go out and vote. I didn't say I was voting for Biden. I didn't say I was voting for Trump. I didn't say Democrat, Republican. And then people just automatically just wanted to come in and put their viewpoints on like me just telling people to vote. When we come back, I'm actually going to, you know, flip the script a little bit because I know a lot of you out there love social media. You're building your business on social media. And I want to pick Tank's brain on how he took his social media following from obviously zero in its inception to 2 million followers. And in addition to that, the engagement that happens with Tank's good news is unbelievable. We'll be right back. All right, so we're back with Tank, and a lot of you uh, follow him on Instagram. And if you don't, you need to go to Tank's Good News or Tank Sinatra because he's the king of mean memes. If you yeah, will. king of memes, king of memes. <laughs> but so Tank, all right, I just need you to help some people out there with some maybe business advice in terms of growing their pages. How did you do it? How did you manage to? you know, take your Instagram and say, Hey, I want to start this Instagram page and grow it to where it is. And in addition to that, I just want to tell you a little story that I love what you did. It was like, yeah, I think it was during quarantine where you said, you know, I want more people to hear about good news every day. So if everyone out there gets someone to follow this page, we can double the following. I just thought that was so cool. Yeah. And more, I thought it was cool more than just sharing uh, or trying to grow your page in, in numbers and just really growing people to, uh, or I should say, helping people hear good news every day, which is not something we hear on TV all the time. So give us some tips and tricks on how you did that and grew this, this empire. Yeah. Um, the initial, so the initial page, I started making memes um, and posting memes and I had a lot of help from larger pages. So that's the only part of the growth that I really can't account for or take credit for, even though obviously you gotta be in the game to be in the game. So if I wasn't making and posting memes, I wouldn't be getting reposted by these bigger accounts. So the first step is start. Drop all the bullshit, you know, all, all the BS, all the excuses, all the lies, drop all that and just act as if you already have a million followers post like you would if you already had a million followers and then grow and let the following grow into that you know so don't say 
oh, I only have two followers, I'm not going to post. I mean, that's a, a, a vicious cycle. It's a whirlpool of, of failure. If you're never going to start, obviously, you never finish. You know that with, with anything, with fitness, business, you never really are done. But um, you got to start and you got to stay consistent. So to stay consistent, you have to pick something that you're interested in or that you're good at. Because if you're not interested in it or you're not good at it, it really should be both. If you're interested in art, but you're a terrible artist, you know, and you post 10, 15 days in a row, eventually you're going to go, eh, this people are not responding well to this. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop. Right. The only way to find out if you're good at something is to start. So again, it all goes back to, to starting and being willing to not be that great at it at first. So you got to be good enough to obviously make a start, but be willing to grow and improve and then from there, it's just a, it's a numbers game. It's a numbers and a time game. You know, you got to wait. The, the, you know, they say compound interest is um, a young person's best friend. If you want to retire, you got to start saving early and then just let it build. It's the same thing with followers. If you're building, if you're growing at 1% per day on 10,000 followers, that growth is going to look a lot different than on 2 million followers. It's still the same percentage. It's just a different number. Um, from there, so one of the things that I, I actually will give myself a little bit of credit for, because I didn't, up until about six months ago, I just looked at this whole thing as a giant, wild, lucky ride that was a fluke and was going to be a house of cards and fall apart at some point, which it may, I don't know. But when I started the, uh, the page Influencers in the Wild, and that page grew to a million in three weeks, and then now, now it's at three and a half million six months into it. There's a, 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 an account called Comments by Celebs. Do you know who that is? I've, I've been posted on there before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what those girls did is they found something new that became um, like it was. So the algorithm on Instagram changed and they saw something before other people saw it and they capitalized on it and they started an account dedicated solely to it. So Tanks Good News was kind of that and then Influencers in the Wild was really that. Like Tanks Good News, I said, there's a hole in the, in the market. Like the news is so – Sean, it's not just bad. I mean, it's bad the way the way kid cereal is bad. Like it's not just bad news. It's like the time they show it, the way they speak, the words they use, the images they use. It's all designed to trigger that that limbic system response, fight or flight, where you're like, oh, man – this news is actually giving me a stomach ache and my heart is beating and my mouth is dry as if I'm getting chased through the woods, but I'm not, I'm on my couch. I can't turn this off because I don't want to miss that next hit. So, I mean, it's like kids cereal is sugary. It's bright. It's the, it's on the right, you know, kids eye level in a supermarket. Like they don't mess around when it comes to that. I don't think they mess around when it comes to the media either. Little linguistic differences that make you so angry and so upset I was like, there's got to be something else. And I had heard of, uh, there was an, there's an account called Upworthy, which is still going there on Instagram, but they were a website, but they were not doing anything at this time. Like the website had kind of petered out. They kind of like, they, they went down this route that I guess didn't prove out for them. And I was like, there needs to be something else. So I'm going to start um, Tank Goodness. And Tank Goodness was taken. taken. And then I said, I'm going to start Tank's Goodness. Oh, that's stupid. I'm going to do Tank's Good News. So I started that. And that, what I didn't know, unwittingly, it, it gave the page a built-in voice and a built-in perspective. Because I think one of the problems with Upworthy was that it was a nameless, faceless corporation. And with the Instagram and the way it goes now, people want to kind of know, like, where is this coming from? And I think that's why it grew so quickly, because people knew that this was just a guy who had gotten fed up with the way the current news cycle was and wanted to do something about it. And they saw themselves in me, so they followed really the only reason people follow i think is to either either not miss something you're going to post or because they relate to you in some way so i think that's why it uh, it got so big the way it did well i think that actually that's a really good tip for people in general you know you want people not to miss a post so what kind of yeah. are you putting out there and then how you connect and i think that uh th i mean that's what i do you know yeah you know, it's more my life. So it's, it's kind of, I don't want to say all over the place, but it encompasses like love, marriage, kids, fitness, motivation. But, yeah. you know, I think also what's really great about your Taints Good News pages, you know, it is one of those pages where you go and you know what you're
Yeah, it's kind of like um, I forget what it's called. It's like a it's one of those pages that it's just like voices or something like that, where you know you're gonna go and you're gonna hear people singing. And I, I just yeah. like, that's it, that's also really, really amazing. All right, um, last question. Something I think that's like very interesting, and I I'm asking you this because when we met a few years, well, when did we met? Last year or the year before? I think it was last year. Yeah, last year. So I was yeah. a new, I was a new newer dad. I'm two and a half. Oh yeah. I'm almost three years in. So, and I just want to say this to you and not to get all like sappy, but you know, I see what you do. I see how you handle people and how you bring goodness to the world. And, you know, like I said, man, like if we were next door neighbors, we'd probably be cooking out all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and there was something you posted, the neighbor in the trash. You remember that post? It was something. Oh, like, yeah. The trash. <laughs> What, what, oh man! About that what was that again? So I had I had a neighbor who was a retired police officer, single, no kids, just took care of his property all day long, and it was a, a relatively small property. So I mean, literally every single blade of grass was accounted for on this guy's lawn. Not a pebble, not a twig. I mean, I'm not even kidding you. It was like one of the cleanest, most well kept properties I've ever seen. <laughs> One of the first years that we were here in the fall, we had a tree that separated our property in the front. And this guy used to rake, he raked his leaves every single day. So he used to rake the leaves and then in his mind calculate what came from my tree and what he was actually responsible for. And he would bag up, let's say an eighth of the leaves and put it on my property. And I was like, holy crap, this guy's nuts. And it really bothered me that he thought that that was okay. So I said to my wife one day, cause I was getting ready to say something to him. I didn't know what I was going to say. Um, but I knew that like, I just felt disrespected, right? My ego was, was being bruised by this guy who thought it was okay to do this. Even though it is my trade and I probably, maybe I should have been over there raking up the leaves, who knows? But I said to my wife, I said, how much does that bag bother you on the lawn? And she goes, I said, on a scale of one to 10, she goes, the bag itself? I said, yeah. She goes, one, I don't know. Like it's, I probably wouldn't even have noticed it if you didn't bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> so then I said, yeah, but how much does it bother you that he thinks it's okay to do that? She was like, oh, nine, nine, maybe an eight, maybe an eight. And I was like, yeah, that's it. So ultimately what I, what I realized was that if I do say, I pictured the conversation in my head. And I pictured myself walking over to him and saying, hey, this leaves that you put on my, on my thing, are they because you're mad at us for having a tree that you, that you don't want the leaves on your property? And in the best case scenario, so worst case scenario, we get into a fist fight immediately on the lawn. That was worst case scenario, which obviously wouldn't happen. Right. Best case scenario is he goes, oh yeah, well, you know, I, I figured because, you know, they're, they're not my leaves, I don't want to keep them on my property. And I was like, if that's the best case scenario, I'm just not gonna say anything. Because what's the point? I'm gonna get my way and feel bad? That doesn't sound right. I'm just gonna keep my mouth shut. It really doesn't bother me. And that was like a major lesson for me when it comes to trying to get your way. It's like, well, what is your way? Why do you think that your way is better than what's currently happening right now? Really, like, really think about that and be honest with yourself. And what it boiled down to was that I felt disrespected. And then once I removed the ego from it, it was a non-issue and then he moved. So who cares? Now the property looks like crap because the guy doesn't take care of it. Not there anymore, I know. And <laughs> the thing that's um, just interesting is I was just thinking, well, at least he didn't just dump it over. You know? Yeah, exactly. So anyway, that was a post that I just thought that was a really cool, interesting story, how you went to your wife, you actually asked her her opinion, you went into your emotional state, you tried to figure out, you know, why am I even thinking like this? And, yeah. uh, and so I think that I wish everyone did that. And that also gives me more insight to, to the way your brain thinks and everyone who's listening to the way your brain thinks, why you would come up with a page that's called tank good news, because you are actually what I like to say, you know, you have good emotional intelligence. So yeah. now to my final question, I need, I want dad advice. Um, mm -hmm. I think because you know, I look at my kids now and, you know, they're almost three and I was actually watching them play outside today. And I, I had this, it was a sad moment, which is so odd because there's nothing sad happening, but 
I had this sad moment that this world is, I, I, I hate to view it like this, but sometimes I feel like this world is so ugly and I have these two happy, you know, innocent children that are learning and we're trying to teach them the right way. And, you know, how do you deal with those moments where you like you have this internal protection of your kids and it makes you feel a certain kind of way? I don't know if that makes sense if that question, like, how do you deal with that in terms of raising your children, especially as a as a dad? Yeah, Um, it's a good question. I mean, it's a question worth asking. I guess I just I always felt like no matter what um, the the end is nigh type people were always there. I mean, you could, have, you could go back to the 1500s and people could say, how could you bring a kid into this world? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, at, at what point has it ever been a good idea to create offspring and allow them to grow up and to be adults? In, in what world, in what time period has it ever been okay or, or a good idea to do that? It's really not. I mean, it, it, but to not do that goes against every basic instinct we have as human beings, which is to, you know, push the species forward and... Uh, I guess I just, I try and teach my kids resilience pretty often, more than anything. And by that, I mean, one of the things that I do that I've never heard of anyone else doing that I think is really valuable. If you, I mean, you have to care a lot about your kids and your family and your own mental well-being. But if my wife and I get into an argument, I'll apologize to her separately. Then I'll apologize to her in front of the kids then I will take the kids and I'll apologize to them for yelling at their mom in front of them. I don't think they really totally understand how, like how uh, all encompassing that apology is, but I want to make sure, cause I remember being a kid and when my parents would fight, depending on who was, who was whatever, I would be mad at one of the other parents for being mean to the other parent. So I just try and like address everything. I don't think that there's any value in brushing things under the rug or trying to hide them from anything. But Sean, I also want to say just from the little bit that I know about you, I mean, there's no, you're, you're not raising kids who are going to contribute to the ugliness of the world. We need your kids to grow up and combat the ugliness that's going to be out there inevitably as it always has been. So when you think of the fact that right now there's a little two year old, three year old boy who's going to grow up to become part of the ugliness through no fault of his own, just by virtue of him being raised by his parents. And I hate to say it, but his parents were raised by their parents and their parents raised by their parents. Like how far back can we go to blame? Where does it start? It doesn't matter. But I think, you know, what we need to do if we care about our children is raise them to be a light in a dark world. Um, And I hesitate to even say that because I don't think the world is dark. I think the world is relatively neutral and what you, you know, you get what you want out of it and you take insults as seriously as your self-esteem will allow you to. Meaning if somebody were to, were to, to tell me that I was dumb, I wouldn't take it seriously because I know that I'm not. You right. know what I mean? If someone were to say that I'm small, I wouldn't take it seriously because I know that I'm not. If someone were to tell me, hey, you're, you're a little fat, I'd be like, ow. Oh. That hurts because I know it's true. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. But, but your point is valid. If people say something that has no truth to it, you don't give it any energy. Cares. But if yeah. it has truth to it, it can affect you. And yeah. it, oh, like you said with your wife and your kids and the apologies you make, it's how you deal with it that determines the outcome of that situation. Yeah, I never shy away from anything. My kids know, I mean, they probably don't really understand what's happening, but um, I remember kissing my son when he was like six months old, right? And and it occurred to me, if I never stop kissing him, it'll never be weird that I try to kiss him, right? So when I'm older and he's older and we get into an argument and I apologize to him, it won't be out of left field where I think pride gets in the way of a lot of people. And if you've never apologized to your kid before, you're not going to start when they're 15. They're 15. It's their fault. They're dumb. They're being a dumb teenager. You know, you're being a dumb teenager too. Mm -hmm. And you're 50. So figure it out. I love that. I love it. I love it. Thank you for that. That actually really helped. Um, just, Just overall in terms of I think when we have that kind of fear and you are raising your kids to be good people, good humans, you 
I'm just for, you sometimes focus on what the world is providing instead of what you're trying to provide to the world through your uh, through your raising of your children. So I appreciate yeah. that. Tank, thank you so much, man. I appreciate the time. I know you are very busy. Uh, hopefully we'll get to kick it one day when I yeah hopefully <laughs> take the wheel one day one day um, much love to your family and I appreciate it man thanks same to you <laughs>